Well, it's good to see you guys today. Everybody smiling today? Okay, David, you lead the way right there. You got a great smile. You keep it up. Just follow David. He'll be, he'll be a good leader for us. Anyway, it's good to see you guys today. Hope you have your Bibles. You'll find with me today Matthew chapter 5. We're going to continue our study in the Beatitudes today. We'll, we'll be in verse 7 alone today. And then, uh, but I'm going to ask you if you would, if you have your Bibles today, I'm going to ask you to sort of turn over toward the end of your Bibles, just before the book of Revelation, a little book called Jude. It's only one chapter, but I'd like for us to start there today. That's where we're going to sort of launch from. Two verses in Jude, verses 24 and 25 sort of wraps up that book. I had, to, I, I had the opportunity, well, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll get there in just a few moments. One, I want to say to you, thank you for coming today and with creativity, figuring out where to park. So uh, the parking lot looks great. It's, it's wonderful, and next week we'll have lines. But this week, we're, uh, it's just creativity. So thank you for using your creativity today to figure that out. And, uh, but uh, anyway, I appreciate so much you doing that and look forward to seeing our time together next. Our youth are back today, and they came back in camp, had a great time. Glad to hear that. And... Uh, They'll be talking, they'll be giving you an update on this in the next little bit. And uh, Mariah is back also from Guatemala. I look forward to hearing back from her as well, uh, giving a report for us of what uh, took place in her trip there. So we'll be looking forward to those in just a few, uh, few days and uh, uh, seeing what God has been doing in the lives of our young people. This past week, we had an opportunity to be able to mourn the passing of one of our dearest people, Miss Cherry Jordan. Uh, many of you all remember Miss Cherry. She uh, was such a backbone of our church for so, so many years. And uh, we had a private burial on Friday of this past week for the family. And then this coming Wednesday will be our service here at the church at 11 a.m. Visitations at 10 you're able to come, we'd love for you to come to support the family. But as I, as I prayed about what to share that day, you know, we typically at a graveside, we typically share 1 Corinthians 15. It talks about the resurrection, the hope of the coming, the promises we have. But I, there was something about Miss Cherry that just drove me to the wrapping up of Jude chapter, or only one chapter, but verses, actually verses 22, I think it was, and following but as I read that, I thought about today's message. I really thought about this Christian life. So oftentimes in life, I wonder if our faith is a, is a lot more theoretical than it is practical. We talk about faith from a theoretical standpoint. It's something that we aspire to, but does it really get lived out? And I really think that's where the Beatitudes is speaking to us about. Jude says it this way. Listen to how Jude ends up, verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you and I from stumbling and to preserve us blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, both now and forevermore. Amen. But aren't you glad that God is able to keep you and I from falling away? I mean, if we had to do it ourselves, how many of you all blew it this week, at least one time? Lying is still a sin. The altar will be open afterwards, lying, you know, anyway. We still blow it. We mess up more times than we would like, but I'm so grateful that my salvation and my eternity is not resting in at all my ability or my perseverance or my faithfulness because at some point in time, there would be somebody that said something or did something, and I would at that moment blow a gasket and Jesus would come back. You know, and that, that, it's just that, it's just that it would work out that way. But I'm so grateful it doesn't work out that way, aren't you? But here's what I, here's the challenge I think. I wonder sometimes if we become so comfortable in his preservation for us that we look at this journey of faith as being something that we talk about more than so than a responsibility that we have to live out. 
And so today, with that sort of mindset, I'd like to dig in to Matthew chapter 5 as we sort of think about this next phase into our, our Sermon on the Mount, or really ultimately the Beatitudes. So with your Bibles open today, I'm going to start back in chapter, chapter 5, verse 1, as we've tried to do every week, and then I'd like, if we can, to pick up from that point. Jesus seeing the crowds, everybody was following him. He had had a master, large number of people coming after him. Chapter 4 tells us that. And the reason why they were following Jesus was because of what Jesus was doing for them. He was healing the sick. He was casting out demons. He was doing miraculous things. And he had amassed a great crowd because of what he was doing and another time John chapter 6 he's also amassed a great crowd he had fed the 5,000 men plus wives and children you know probably 15 20,000 people he fed and if you were to walk on down John chapter 6 you're going to find that Jesus made some very tough statements to that crowd because he pointed out to them that they were following him only because of what he was doing for them they were following him for, the, for him feeding them, and they were not seeing any sense of responsibility and in in understanding what it really meant to follow the Lord Jesus. The Bible says in John 6, 66, and many that day walked away and followed him no more because it was too hard. When we open up the Beatitudes, I think we're coming to another one of those places that's a bit hard. The crowds were there. He sat down on a mountain, and when he sat down, the disciples came to him, and verse 2 says, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Today, blessed are the merciful, for they they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. As we look at this passage of Scripture today, the cir- what seems to be a bit of a circular ar- argument, verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive what? Mercy. Let me, if I can, dig into here and into our notes a little bit. Mercy, therefore, becomes the extension of attention to those in misery. First point in your notes, please. From, th- from this, we make the important distinction between mercy and grace. Grace becomes then that which is shown to the undeserving. Mercy is compassion. It's the emotional activity that's given to the miserable. Mercy is not simply a feeling or feeling compassion. Mercy exists when something is done to alleviate distress. When we look at this passage of Scripture, when we look at the context of the whole Word of God, we find time after time after time where mercy is extended from heaven toward us. And so this morning, I'd like for us to talk about that in that perspective and understand a few things regarding mercy. In your notes this morning, I want us to first note that mercy is compassion in action. It is, it, is, it is a feeling, it is an emotion, yes, but it's an active form of that emotion. I, 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 I remember a story about a 19th century preacher who was walking down the way, and he came upon one of his friends in his neighborhood, and he had noticed that the friend had actually, his horse had been shot and killed accidentally. And his, he was, his friend was attending to the horse and, and sort of there sort of weeping, grieving over the loss. And there were other pastors by that day that people came by and said what we all would say, man, I'm sorry for your loss, right? We do that often. I'm sorry for your loss. I'm sorry that things have happened this way. And this 19th century preacher, the story tells us that, that as he came by, 
he said to the group and he said to the young man who had lost his horse, he said, I'm sorry, five pounds worth. And begin to pass the hat to everybody else to be able to say, how sorry are you? Because mercy is something that cost us something. Mercy is something that is not just a feeling of the heart, but it's an action that's played out in the life of those who are displaying or extending mercy toward others. Here's what I want us to know as we look at Scripture. We need to understand that mercy is really flowing out of or it's a part of the character of God. It finds its origin in who God is. You see that probably in a, in, in a passage that we all probably know very well, Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 23, that goes something like this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every what? Morning. Great is your faithfulness. So every morning we wake up. Every morning that we find ourselves coming, there's a brand spanking new day. And what we find at that beginning of that brand new day is his mercy is fresh all over again today. That's who God is. As a matter of fact, if we were to be able to look at that from a very literal translation in Lamentations 3 verse 22 that says the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercy has never come to an end. It literally translates itself this way. Because of the steadfast love of the Lord, we are not cut off we deserve to be cut off my goodness that's exactly what mercy is all about it's it's not giving us what we otherwise would deserve and we find scripture from the beginning all the way to the end of mercy being demonstrated from our heavenly father here's what we also know psalm 145 verse 9 says that the lord is good not to just a few people but to all His mercy exists for all that he has made. We do know that. God God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, right? We look around us and we see that the the benefits and the blessings uh, uh, are so many, for for everybody, are so all around us. There's so much all around us. And we, we begin to see that and experience that and recognize that. But the reality is while the mercy is shown to everyone, there is a special expression of mercy that's found up in the, in the extension of God's grace, particularly to those who are his own. Listen to the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, nobody would ever question that, because of the great love which he has loved us with, even while you and I were dead in our trespasses and sins, He has made us alive together with Christ. How did he do that? By the grace of God, you and I have been saved. For by grace are you saved? Not not through faith, not of works, lest any man should what? Boast. The reality was God in his mercy has demonstrated mercy to all of us, and yet through mercy he has extended grace to those of us who trust and believe and have chosen to become followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to know, I need to be reminded that mercy is wrapped up in the person of God and who God is. It it really flows out of the character of God and I need to be reminded of that. So if I'm going to be called by God to live godly in Christ Jesus, should it also be expected that if God is merciful that he should expect you and I to as well? Let me say point number, letter B in your notes. The next point is this. Mercy is foundational to God's covenant with us or with mankind as well. We were to go back in the Old Testament and begin to drown a little bit about mercy. And we'd see mercy played out in a lot of different ways. And, but one, one book particularly we find in the Old Testament that's really, it's really filled up with a lot of mercy. It's, a book, it's the book of, called Hosea. I don't know if you all read much in a, the Old Testament Hosea or not, but Hosea was called to marry a lady by the name of, anybody remember? Gomer. Gomer was, wasn't the most faithful lady. Let me just put it that way. During Gomer and Hosea's married life, there were many extramarital affairs. 
And uh, God continued to tell Hosea to go back and get his wife. Go back and get your wife. Go back and get your wife. And as we, as we see that played out, God ultimately will tell the nation of Israel, here's what I want you to gather from this story. Real life story, this guy, real guy named Hosea, real lady named Gomer, un, uh, just a, not a great relationship at all. But here's what I want you to grasp from this story. I want you to know that, God, I'm representing the person of Hosea. You as a nation of Israel are the, are the lady Gomer. You have continually turned your back from me, turned your back upon me, turned your back from me, and I find myself again and again and again coming after you to pursue a relationship with you because I am merciful toward you. The reality is the reason why it was is because God had begun a covenant with the nation of Israel. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 17 says it this way, They shall be mine that's the nation of Israel. They're his people, says the Lord of hosts. In the day when I will make up my treasure possession, I will spare them as a son, as a man spares his son who serves him. Why? Because relationally, the nation of Israel is in covenant relationship with God. And we know what the Apostle Paul would tell us in the book of Romans is that while the New Testament has come to a place we now live in New Testament ages, the reality is we have been grafted in the vine because of a faith relationship with Jesus Christ. So the same promises of covenant that the Old Testament people had, we have today as well. And so we need to know that while God is merciful and it's in his character, he's also demonstrating mercy specifically because of the covenant relationship that he has with you and I. And as it is, if he's calling us to be godly, and if he is calling us into a relationship that we're covenantly in relationship with God, can we not expect God to always be merciful to us? Hello? Yes. His, his mercies are new what? Okay. Therefore, as we understand that, we can, be, we can anticipate God's mercy coming our way, him being merciful to us. There's a third thing I want us to make sure we don't miss here is that mercy is modeled by the life of Christ. We see that lived out in a lot of ways, and, and we could really pick any story, but I, I, Pastor Jim did such a great job a few weeks ago regarding the woman at the well. I felt like this would be a great story for us just to revisit since it's probably fresh on our mind. You know the story. The lady was caught in adultery. She was brought before Jesus, and the, the religious leaders had brought her to Jesus to accuse her that ultimately Jesus would, be, would ultimately carry forth what was rightfully due to her. The law would say, since she was caught in adultery, she should be stoned. Therefore, bring him to Jesus to test him. We, the scripture does, imply, does tell us that. But to see whether Jesus would actually carry out the law that he should be carrying out. Well, we know what happened when Jesus, she, he hears the accusation. He probably notices the, the circumstances, notices probably that the guy who was in adultery with her never, anyway, just that's, that's a whole different story. Why they didn't bring the guy, I don't really know. It might have been one of the Pharisees. Who knows? You know, I don't know. But whatever it was, they brought the lady, and Jesus did, he just bent down on the ground, started riding in the, in the dirt. We're not told what he wrote. Pastor Jim talked about that. We're not told exactly what he wrote. And I'm not sure we'll ever know this side of eternity, but, but, she, but he wrote. And as he was, as he was writing, he, he looked at the Pharisees, and this is what he said, verse 7, John 8, verse 7. And they continued to ask him. And he stood up and said to them, Let him of you who is without sin be the first one to cast a stone at her. And Jesus did this most amazing thing. He knelt, knelt back down and started writing again in the sand. The Bible says, verse 9, when, he, when they heard it, one by one they went away, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus finally stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go now and sin no more. 
You see, what she rightfully deserved, he chose to withhold. He did not give to her what she deserved. He demonstrated mercy to her that day and demonstrated to all of us through not only that story but through a lot of other stories in the life of Jesus exactly what mercy looks like because all we have to do is look at the life of Jesus and what he did as he was faced with people around him. There's one more thing I want us to take note of today before I move on. Mercy, therefore, is the response to those who have been shown mercy. It's it's not the natural response. It's not natural for us to show mercy. It's difficult. Matter of fact, it may be the exact opposite thing that we are inclined to do. But the scripture tells you and I that As we have been the recipients of mercy, it is our responsibility to extend mercy. Like in chapter 6 and verse 8, a verse that maybe many of you have committed to memory somewhere along the way. He's shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of us, from, uh, from all of us, to act justly, to what love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. He's called us as his followers That those of us who have been recipients of mercy, for us to be able to be those who would extend mercy or share mercy with those around us. Matter of fact, Colossians, Paul would write in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, as followers of Christ, we have the responsibility to put on the clothing of Christ, put on the likeness of Christ, to live live life as Christ lived it, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you and I as followers of Christ must forgive. So mercy is given to us, and we're the recipients of it. We have benefited greatly from it, and yet God has called us as followers of Christ to be those who would extend mercy to those around us as well. It's not as we have a choice to pick and choose. You know, when we look at these beatitudes, it's not as if we, I like this one, I don't like this one. That's not, that's not the issue. If we're going to be like Christ, God tells us, We're going to have to learn to demonstrate mercy in the world in which we live. Let me go point number two, because I let's try to define mercy just a little bit further. I think mercy is many times in Scripture equated with forgiving. Robert Gulick, actually, a common Greek New Testament scholar, actually writes that the one who forgives and pardons another who is in the wrong is the one who actually demonstrates mercy. We find ourselves in this culture just continuing to live out uh, that we find ourselves oftentimes being overwhelmed by, the, by things that have come against us. Remember the, sto- remember the last co- chorus the praise team sang? That what someone intended for evil, God turned around for what? It, the story has its setting in Joseph in Genesis chapter, well, starting at about Genesis chapter 32, I believe it is, all the way, th- all the way through Genesis chapter 50. Genesis, Joseph finds himself in a, in a really tough spot. His brothers didn't like him. They were jealous of him. They threw him in a pit, was intended to kill him, and saw a, a band of gypsies uh, running and walking, and, and they actually chose to sell him to the band of gypsies who ultimately sold him to Egypt, and he found himself in Egypt and, and ultimately was taken advantage of there. Potiphar's wife took advantage of him. He found himself in living, staying in prison a long time. And somehow through, this, through these decades of time that he found himself being overwhelmed by the circumstances that seemed to be against him, he turns out to become the second, le- second most per- powerful person in charge of Egypt because God had a plan. And therefore, Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, what you intended for evil, God has brought about for good. That's how we get, that's how Paul actually helps us to see in the New Testament. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. 
we may not always understand it, but we begin to see how God in his great mercy demonstrates his, his sovereignty over, over our world to take care of us and, and to work through us and ultimately what, to, to forgive us so time and time and time again to allow us the opportunity to, to thrive and to become the men and women God's called us to be to begin with. Paul said, Roman, the writer of Hebrews said in Romans 8, 12, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Thank God for that, right? Colossians 3, verse 13, as God has, has chosen to bear with us, he's called us to bear with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, we're called to forgive that one as the Lord has forgiven you. So we must forgive. In Ephesians 4.32, be kind one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, because Christ has first forgiven us. And so mercy is oftentimes equated, lived out best in the aspect of forgiveness. There's a third thing I want us to say in this passage of Scripture, and that's this. is the promise that we've been called to receive, for they shall receive mercy. The, in, the idea is behind this, or at least the implication is, and they, while the, this passage doesn't say that, he would say in Matthew chapter 6, if we were to go over in Matthew 6, he says, if we choose not to forgive our brothers, God will not forgive us. The implication seems to appoint itself in Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they will receive mercy. And the opposite seems to be implied here as well. For if you choose not to extend mercy, it's not going to be given back to you. And Jesus gives to us a great story. And I'd love for you to turn with me over to Matthew 18. It's one I'm sure you've seen in the past. But I'd like for us to look at it just one more time in context of this passage. The story starting in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, is a story of the unforgiving servant. Remember that story? The context of verse 21 starts out this way. Peter. You know, Peter's oftentimes asking the hard questions. Putting his foot in his mouth, you know, doing things. And Peter's, you know, no doubt he's got something going on. If you've been watching The Chosen, you probably have seen something of the context of the the the. the conflict even even among those the 12 chosen you know the the, the 12 apostles and uh but Peter here is having a conflict he's having some struggle and he came to him and said came to Jesus and said this Lord verse 21 how often will my brother sin against me and how often do I have to forgive him I think it would be very gracious for, for me to forgive him seven times. I've got a hunch that whoever it was that had wronged him, this was probably number eight. You know, you've got to find a way out. Jesus said to him, uh, it's not seven, but 70 times seven, some translations are 77 times other translations, but obviously it's a lot more than seven times. The implication is that there's not an ending uh, God, God doesn't put any ending. You know, you've messed up 223 times. You're done. He doesn't put an ending on us, and I'm grateful for that. So therefore, we don't put an ending on others. Verse 23, and then he gives to, this, gives to us this story, this illustration to help us to be able to see how that's lived out and how it should be lived out. And he tells a story for the kingdom of heaven. You know, we are, we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven today. As, as a follower of Jesus Christ, we have, we have been born into a family. And that family one day is going to spend eternity with the Lord in heaven. And one of these days we will live in the kingdom of heaven. But today we're yet living in the kingdom of heaven spiritually today, even though we're not physically there yet. So whatever God's looking for on the other side is expected on this side. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven will be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And he began to call folks before him and said, you know, we need to figure this thing out. And when he, when he began to settle, verse 24, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, a talent is the largest part of currency 
that's found in the, uh, basically in the Jewish culture. The denarii was probably the lowest part of, cult, uh, of t- currency. And uh, the, t- the, the, the uh, uh, talent is worth about 6,000 denarii. In other words, a, a denarii was basically one day's wage. A talent would be 6,000 days wage. And he's given to, brought someone before him that owes him 10,000 talents. 10,000 times 6,000 is a lot. Let's just put it that way. People have tried to calculate that to some level in currency today and many have sort of speculated that that's probably somewhere around 200 million dollars it's more money than any of us will ever see in this lifetime verse 25 goes on and since he could not pay i don't know how i don't know how he ever gotten that much debt but anyway he did And he couldn't pay, so his master ordered him to be sold, his wife and his children, and all that he had in payment to be made. Never would ever raise up to that level, but he was done with him. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I'll pay you everything. And I don't know how in the world he would have ever done it, but he said, I will. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the entire debt. Wouldn't you love to be a part of a, be the recipient of a bank like that? Ah, your house mortgage, just go, don't, don't worry about it, it's done, paid off. Verse 28, but when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, a hundred days wages. Probably somewhere, if you wanted to find it, maybe in our culture today, probably somewhere about $2,000. You've got a difference between $200 million and $2,000. So there's a lot, big, vast difference. But he sees this man, began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. His fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, I'll pay you everything. And he could have probably. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were troubled and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. You know, the slave owed his master a a huge sum. His friend owed him a small sum. The master forgave the man all. He forgave the man who owed him nothing. Verse 32, then his master summoned him and said, I'm proud of you, young man. Is that what he said? Mm -mm. You wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant just like I had mercy on you? And his anger... And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all of his debt. And then this statement in verse 35. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of us if we choose not to forgive our brother from our heart. Hmm. You know, when you look at the Beatitudes, there, there, we've talked about this previously. There is a progression of sorts in the Beatitudes. The first three Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed is the one who understands he is spiritually broke, bankrupt before God. I have nothing to offer. Blessed is the one who mourns. That I've learned to understand it's my sin that is separating me from God and I'm I'm. I'm wrecked by my own sin and ultimately the the effects of sin I see all across our world. I mourn and grieve for that. Blessed are the meek. I've learned to come to a place that I've, in the process of life, in my desperation, in my poverty of spirit, in my mourning, I've come to the place that I find myself 
submitted unto the authority of God and I've, I'm simply willing to walk out this journey of faith and, 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 and submission to him and, and in direction of him underneath his word and I find myself meek, power under control so that the next one, verse 4, or the number 4, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. God's called us to that. It's the life he's called us to. We can't do it ourselves. The Pharisees thought they had it mastered. And yet, chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus says, unless your Pharisees, your, your, your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you'll never get in. As a matter of fact, if you want to measure righteousness out, chapter 5, verse 48, the very last verse in ch- verse, chapter 5, he would say, you've got to be perfect just like God. So it's an impossible task. And yet he's called us to hunger and thirst for that so that we might be filled. And then we find the beginning here with this fifth beatitude and the rest of them are beatitudes of action as a result of what God has done in our life to humble us, to direct our focus toward righteousness that action, that, that righteous, that pursuit of righteousness then brings forth action of our life. And the first piece he talks about is that of mercy. You know, when I look around our world today, I, I, I wonder for us, I wonder what the world actually sees out of us. Do we demonstrate enough of the character of God in our lives that they could actually see something uniquely different within us than what they see with the rest of the world? I know, and this is sort of my pet peeve I've I've said many times, I know as it relates to those ladies and gentlemen who are our servers at the restaurants on Sunday afternoon. I know I've said this to you. I know it doesn't happen from anybody from Northridge Church. I I know it's, it's the churches down the street. I got it. But what they say regularly is that the meanest people they see all week long are the Christian people leaving church. And yet you and I have been called to be light to a dark world. Salt to a world who desperately needs saltiness. To a world who needs change, life-giving power. And we have been called in that process to be like Jesus and in order to be like Jesus we're going to have to learn to demonstrate mercy you know the word of God is sharp it's alive it's living and it cuts us oftentimes not because it is seeking to do harm to us but it's in cutting us that it seeks to transform us by the power of the Spirit of God. So as we think about this thing called mercy, I'd like for us to consider this last statement by way of application. Here it is. These are hard, violent, and here's your next fill in the word, surgical words. But they are mercifully so. The Lord here warns the religious person who attends church can recite appropriate answers, leads an outwardly moral life, but holds a death grip on his grudges. Jesus warns the one who will not forgive his relatives or his former business associates regarding pleas. Such a person had better take stock in his or her life. Why? Because if we have been shown mercy, we must show mercy. Augustine prayed this way, demand what you will so that we might give what you demand. God's word is tough, but we're going to live out the character of Almighty God. We're going to have to take stock of the way we live our lives. In a world that is often ugly and difficult for us to live in, we're going to have to learn to live our lives in this world and live it Christ-like. Would you bow with me for prayer, please? 
Lord Jesus, we pause today to acknowledge the fact that we are all fallen individuals. We're broken. There's nothing that we have within us that is good. We've talked about that over the last few weeks. None of us deny that. And yet, Lord, we do recognize in the world that we live in, we oftentimes long to find a way. We want to hang on to the need or the desire for retribution, for resolve, maybe a little bit of vindication. I hear the words of Jesus as he's nailed to the cross. There's no doubt the weight of his body thuds and pulls against the nails that have been pierced into his hands and his feet. As he looked out to the men and women, men that day that actually drove the nails in his hands and those who had placed the crown of thorns upon his head. those who had spit upon him cursed him even those who denied him that walked close with him at times his first words off the cross ought to ring heavy upon our hearts as he said father forgive them for they know not what they do so God, today as I look around our world and as we recognize that we've oftentimes been wronged and all of us have, we've all found ourselves in circumstances that are weighty and difficult and times we would rather not be in, been abused and criticized and whatever else could be said about us. I pray, oh God, today that we might not find ourselves demanding to be a victim of our circumstances but rather we might find the freedom to live out what you have called us to do and that's simply to demonstrate mercy let you deal with the mess hand it over to you and just simply say Lord it's yours and I choose to forgive I choose to let go I choose to release from any responsibility those who have harmed us God may it be so for all of us for it's then that we will live out demonstrate the character of almighty God follow after the model that Christ lived out upon the cross and through his life and ultimately then extend mercy because we have been the recipients of so much mercy. I pray that you would call us out to rise up, rise to the occasion, to do that which Jesus did on our behalf. And we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.